It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Bruce Boyce. Hi, Bruce. How are you? Hey, very good. Did I get your name right? It's Boyce, right? Yes. <laughs> yes okay. It is Boyce. It uh, is Boyce. Okay. Because uh, I could have said boys, you know, with like a Z sound, but I wasn't sure. Oh, um, my. You know, I, I know. And, and Douglas, people go, Boise, boys. I mean. So this is an interesting story. I was reading through your bio, and. Uh, you worked for 24 years in the pharmaceutical industry, basically in sales, right? Um, so sales at first and then a manager, yep. Okay. And you discovered some rather perhaps unholy alliances. That might be a, yeah, one way yeah. to put it. Uh, when I was a, when I was a mar- manager and we were in a meeting and, and uh, some of my reps came back to me and said, you know, the, the Virginia – district is making all this money in bonus and i'm going and how's that and they said well with this one product and i go well we we don't promote that very much right now and why are they making that kind of money and what i found out is that they were uh promoting that that drug off label and i'm going oh, we're not doing first of all we're not doing that but i thought it was a rug manager doing that and um, and to my chagrin really I found out that it was a company-wide process that we were going to start promoting off-label with all our drugs. Okay, explain what off-label means, because I don't think a lot of people know what that is. Sure. An off-label prescription can be a prescription by a physician that deems it necessary because the patient has, has gone through other treatments and they have not worked. And so the physician is looking for something extra in the armamentarium that he could use. Um, and, and a lot of times that can be really effective for a physician to uh, treat patients. For a drug company to promote off-label, and off-label meaning outside of the indication that the drug was originally approved for, uh, that's illegal. A physician can write for a drug that's off-label to its original indication but a company cannot promote their drug for that. So if a particular drug, drug X, is supposed to be prescribed for high blood pressure, let's say, and a doctor prescribes it to somebody for headaches or some other treatment other than high blood pressure, that would be considered off-label? That would be considered outside of its indication, correct. Okay, and so for pharmaceuticals, it's illegal for them to tell the doctor, oh, well, you can prescribe drug X for headaches also, as well as blood pressure. Correct. Okay, I got it. Okay, I got it. So I guess the, uh, the next question is, why would pharmaceuticals do that? Why would they want to recommend they- the drug? for Just for sales? Just strictly for numbers? For money? Yeah, just for greed, money. That's why. Okay. I suppose that's the, uh, the motivation for many things in this country. Right. Well, what, ha- what occurs with that, to expand a little bit on that, what occurs is that, you know, as a, as a fledgling biotech company, you go and buy an orphan drug and you spend, you know, $100 million to buy the drug. But if you want, and, and, and maybe its indication is pretty narrow, and so it's not going to make a lot of money and you really can't market it very well. But, oh, by the way, it has great potential off-label and other medical conditions. So they buy the orphan drug and they start promoting the drug off-label to physicians for other indications. So if a particular drug has potential to be useful in a different treatment, why wouldn't the, I assume the FDA... Why wouldn't they encourage the, that particular drug to also be uh, labeled as 
a potential treatment for something else? I mean, what would be the point of uh, not doing that? The, the pharmaceutical companies that would, would promote illegally off-label, they have a, a big dollar amount that they have to spend to get a new indication. And it takes oh, decades to get okay. it. It okay. takes hundreds and hundreds, if not billions of dollars for them to receive the new indication and from the FDA. And so consequently, they just decide to save the time and the money and go around that, promote it off-label. Okay. So if something is off-label, yeah, it does. Um, this is kind of new territory for me, so I'm learning as well. But my listeners would uh, also be be curious to understand the definitions because it's it's not something sure. that I think you know people talk about in general conversation and doesn't seem to come up. So, in other words, there's a lot of red tape involved to get a particular yes. drug labeled to do something other than what it was originally intended for. And correct. Okay. Well, I suppose that brings up a good question about uh, big farm and cutting the profit sort of incentive out of it, which has been always an argument for people who want to socialize medicine. Uh, if they take the profit out of medical treatment, hospitals, all of that, you're going to cut all of this out. The argument against it is that we're going to diminish our quality care. What do you think about that? Do you think if we take the profit out that it's going to... Uh, diminish the quality no, of care I, that I, we have? I, I don't I don't think so. I I, I think there, there's a lot of pharmaceutical co companies that wind up making Me Too products. They, they have a drug for um, asthma, and they come out with a 24-hour release asthma drug, which is really a derivative of your, the one they started with. They get the indication, and then they, then they push to go to the 24-hour duration asthma drug. And so there's a lot of that, I think, that goes on in the industry that people then look at their costs in R&D going, you know, there's so much money going on R&D, but you're really not producing anything new for, you know, the citizens, for, for patients. And, and that tends to bring a negative effect, ne negative effect on pharmaceutical companies and sometimes greedy uh, people like the, the folks that I had to deal with with the FDA and and file uh, false claims act fraud cases against because th they're they are rogue companies and they're doing criminal activity but there's there's also the other side of the coin where for example the vaccination that's coming out uh, for COVID from Pfizer and from Johnson and Johnson and and Moderna and all that that's a real positive effect. And that's a collaboration through all the different pharmaceutical companies that really have pulled together and have done yeoman's work. And they should get credit for that as well as, as companies that that do wrong as far as the ones that I dealt with. But but like I said, there's, there's two sides of that coin to look, look at. So specifically with you, the drug was called, what's it called? Uh, how do you pronounce it? Cephalon? Uh, Ceplon's the company, and the drug was called Actic. Oh, okay. And or Actic. Some some pronounce it Actic. So it's I call it Actic. Okay. What was the drug used for? A C T I Q. A A C T I Q. A C T I Q. Okay. What what was this drug used for? Well, this drug was used for um, pain, um, and it was. A drug used for it, the indication was for uh, breakthrough cancer pain, and so a lot of it was used in hospital. Okay, so it was not a drug that it was a fentanyl product, and it, it did you know at the time that the company bought it, it really wasn't a product that was marketed very effectively at all. And what the company did is take the product and market it for low back pain and migraine and every other pain you could think of. So is it an opioid Which drug? Is, yes, it's a synthetic opioid. And the fentanyl is, is the product that has gotten this country into a lot of trouble in oh. the opioid crisis. Well, your book, the book you're promoting is called Cold Comfort, is that correct? Correct. Okay. And that's kind of the story well, of this particular thing, of this drug? 
yeah, the subtitle, the subtitle is One Man's Struggle to Stop the Illegal Marketing of Powerful Opioid Drugs and Save Lives. Okay, I'm just going to read this. After exposing how Cephalon was illegally marketing off-label prescription drug use, waited many years to see justice after wearing a wire, losing his job, becoming homeless, and blackballed by the pharmaceutical industry. So you want to tell us a little about that? Just you want to tell us that story? Oh, sure. Um, when I first asked, I went to go back to when I thought the company was doing wrong and, and I went to HR to try to resolve it and found out it was a company-wide thing. I really didn't have any other avenue available for me. So I decided I was going to take a vacation week and just get my resume together and find another company to work for because I couldn't work for them. And a nurse called me and she said, would you do something about it, basically? And I said, well, sure, if I could, but I just don't see that. Well, her sister, the nurse's sister, was FBI. And so they got in touch with me with the FDA. And I originally thought I could turn over my information about the comp- what the company was doing and how they were promoting off-label. And then I could just move on with my another job and move on. And what the, and what the the Justice Department wanted and the DOJ wanted was they wanted uh, me to wear a wire. And so I wore a wire for them, and I built a case against Cephalon. And uh, as that was moving along and that was working pretty well, um, the company found out and fired me basically, and then blackballed me from the industry. And when that happened, then I lost everything. I lost my house, cars, all savings. It was pretty bad. How long ago was this? Uh, Probably when everything fell apart was 2003. Okay. So what happened next? It says you were flipping burgers Um, for 10 bucks an hour to get by. But you did move forward with the case, right? Yes, we moved forward with the case. Uh, The case settled successfully. The company was fined four hundred twenty-five million dollars, and um, the the four different. I was one of four uh, relators, which um, at that point I I became a whistleblower, but I really didn't even know what a whistleblower was. I mean, I I thought I was going to be an I was really an undercover informant until the agent that I was working with for the government said, "You really need to get a lawyer and protect yourself because I think there's going to be a big fine." And so what happened then is that we settled and things got better financially for me, obviously. Um, But then the company decided to keep on doing what they were doing. And the government came back to me and said, Bruce, would you file a second case against this company again? And I said, no, (laughs) (laughs) I'm done with this. Is there no oversight to these companies? I mean, the fact that they get caught, they pay their fine. And then they go right back to doing what they were doing before. There is no oversight uh, were, on these companies. They thought there's an oversight. They did a corporate integrity agreement, and they were supposed to be reporting it for risk management. And and they just sort of had this one arm doing the risk management, reporting to the government, and the other arm was that they were just continuing selling off label. And the government came back to me, and well, really, what what occurred with that is that. I found out through my sources that uh, there were five overdoses of, of patients that had migraines and the the new product that they had, fentanyl, which is another, Fentora was a new product for them and, and Fentora was uh, a fentanyl product that they had overdosed. And so they were selling Fentora off-label and they had overdoses and we were trying to warn the DOJ and when we said something to the DOJ, the DOJ said, oh, we're going to, we need to file another case. Are you willing to file another case? And so that's, that case took 10 years to do. Now, has all of so, this off-label, the practice of, of selling things off-label, has that contributed to the opioid crisis that we've all heard about? I would say yes, Okay, Douglas, because if you look at, if you look at uh, Purdue and OxyContin, and um, their fines, and also their even their uh, Kinsley, their McKinsley, their management group got fined for five hundred seventy-eight million dollars for 
participating in and formulating the, the marketing scheme for their for their oxycontin push and so if you look at j and j and they were involved with uh, their fentanyl patch and duragesic and also with cephalon with their fentanyl product so i would say you know if you start looking at that in totality yes all right they got it they certainly got the fentanyl product out on the market didn't they yeah uh, we're kind of running out of time, but I did want to hit on one of your talking points on your bio sure. here. It says, how pharma and doctors operate. Uh, what would be the motivation for doctors to take off-label drugs? For the doctors to take off-label drugs? Yeah, I mean, why? Then personally? Not, I, don't mean, I don't mean take them. I mean take them to give to patients. I mean, why would that benefit them? Well, this, they're not going to get well, paid doctors, for that, right? Well, the doctors are looking for something that, you know, they may have 10, 15 patients in their, pay, their overall practice that have stumped them. They're looking for something new that can help those really difficult patients. So for a, as a practice, you know, you're, 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 the, those physicians are looking for something that could help them. So, of course, they're curious and interested in seeing whether that drug works effectively in that area. And for them... That's a legal uh, thing for them to do. That's a normal thing for them to do. So it's not illegal for doctors to prescribe off-label? Correct. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. But, so it, so it's a, that's, a, that's a perfectly legitimate prescription. Okay. I'm still trying to figure out why that's perfectly legitimate. Uh, doctors can prescribe drugs for a particular ailment that a patient has that the particular drug is not approved for for use correct De Depo depacote um is an anti-seizure drug depacote is used for mood swings in psychiatry depacote has now become really a, a gold standard in in mood disorders in psychiatry and that really is an off-label prescription has been but what a great discovery it was to to have something that works so well in mood disorders. Now, you can reapply in the application of a drug and then have an indication, a new indication added. And when it has great data like that, and it's great, great benefit, then that's usually a normal procedure. But it's, it's not out of the realm for a physician to prescribe an off-label to see if, if it helps within a certain medical condition. And that's in, in the that's in the preview of the physician. They're legally able to do that. Okay. But a pharmaceutical company cannot promote that. And one of one of the great things I'm working or hope to to correct is the False Claims Act. Is that you know there's a big stink about the First Amendment as as free speech, so that the pharmaceutical company claims uh, as a as a corporation to have free speech. So they can disseminate information that's off label. <laughs> and that's how they promote. This, and that's how they promote. Yeah, this gets into a very gray area in a whole nother Pandora's it box. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Doesn't it? Because on the one it's hand it's fascinating actually. It is fascinating because and and it doesn't just apply to pharmaceuticals, it applies to almost everything. No. Uh, yes. Yeah. When you when you look at I mean, even something like uh, Twitter banning President Trump. You know, it, one Correct. could make the argument there. I'm not for or against Trump in this particular argument. I'm just saying that, you know, if somebody makes a statement and it gets banned, that is a violation of free speech. Right. However, if it somebody is, is disseminating is. false information that could be damaging to people, Correct. misleading, such as pharmaceuticals, saying this is the uh, the wonder cure drug for cancer, when in fact it's not, then do we have right. an obligation to and ban they, that that speech from them? Yeah, well, uh, Douglas, that actually is the crux of the matter with that. When you said uh, m misleading or harmful information, uh, my lead counsel even talks about that, that that's where it's the trigger is that, is it misleading? Is it harmful information that the pharmaceutical companies are, are disseminating? Right. So we do have to wrap this up. Unfortunately, we are 
running sure. out of time quickly. Uh, so what are you doing now? Fast forward to today. What What is your life like now? What are you working on? Um, I do a lot of uh, speaking engagements. I do uh, some national speaking with some uh, folks that are uh, like prop and and uh, fed up and different organizations and to help people ad- addicted to opioids. Um, also, you know, I am uh, hope to help um, with the anti-fentanyl vaccination. So I'm on that front and to be an advocate for that. And generally a patient advocate to help folks understand the opioid crisis and where we're at now today with it. Oh, that's great. Do you have a website you want to give out? Sure. It's uh, bruceboyce.com. Bruceboyce.com, spelled B-O-I-S-E. Yeah. Okay. Correct. <laughs> All right, Bruce. Well, thanks so much for coming on. This was interesting. There's a lot of stuff I did not know. And uh, I'm always happy when well, I good. get good. a guest good. on that I learn something. Good. So thanks so much for coming on. Best of luck with, with your work and what you're doing. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on The Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of The Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Love coffee, huh? But wait a minute. It seems like every time you finish a cup of coffee, you get all of these side effects along with it. Heartburn, digestion, upset stomach, acid reflux. As the world's first and only organic acid-free coffee, Tyler's Coffee is able to provide a healthier option in the solution for more than 100 million individuals who have sensitive stomachs or suffer from acid-related modalities. This is Tyler's Acid-Free Coffee. Coffee without the consequences. Hi, this is John Morgan, Production Supervisor for DJC Productions. You're listening to The Douglas Coleman Show. Okay, please welcome to The Douglas Coleman Show, Karina Cantus. Hi, Karina, how are you? I'm very well, Douglas, how are you? I'm doing fine, thank you. You are in Greece, right? I am on the island of Corfu in Greece, that's correct, but I'm from England, as you can tell from my accent. (laughs) How long have you lived in Greece? 27 years now. Oh, long time. Well, what brought you there? Yeah. I came on holiday with my sister and fell in love. You fell in love with Greece or fell in love with someone? <laughs> fell in love with my husband. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Uh, and he is Greek, I assume? He is. He was working uh, as a in a cocktail bar oh. as a barman. Yeah. Oh, very good. So you're also an author, and I would suspect that uh, that's a great place to be to write, yeah? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd be in the Lake District in the, in the UK and write, you know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm in my house, so I, I don't go out much, you know, with the lockdown. And even when I was writing the books before the uh, pandemic, I hardly left the house. So uh, now and again, you know, to, to have a coffee and get a bit of a, a change of atmosphere. But most of the time I write in the house. Is it any more inspirational? there or not yes but i mean yeah some places are absolutely beautiful you look at out to the beach or you sit in a beautiful coffee shop with all the greek people and yeah very inspirational and uh but so is music so i can sit at home listen to music and and write and that's just uh, as important to me okay how's the weather there in the winter time it's not really cold, cold is it is it cold, cold? Yeah, we get to minus. We get the frost. I always pictured it as somewhat, you know, semi-tropical, but I guess it's not really. 
I know a lot of people think we live on the equator for some reason. <laughs> but it's it's warmer than England would be, right? Oh yeah, much warmer. So why don't you tell us a little about your writing? Tell us about your books, what you write. I've got so much that's happened over this last uh, few weeks. Uh, loads and loads of news. Well, I'm a prolific. Well, excuse me, I'm a pro prolific author, and uh, I write in uh, all fiction genres. Um, and even poetry and prose as well as uh, freelance in non-fiction. But my fiction books, I read, I started um, when I was 18. Um, many, many, many years later, I'm now on my 14th book. And like I say, I, I had, I started off writing MC thrillers about outlaw motorcycle clubs um, because you should always write about what you know, especially for your debut novel. And that was always part of my life with the bikers and people around uh, my family like that. And um, so I did a, a set, a series called Outlaw. And then I went from there to fantasy, <laughs> which is a total uh, uh, 160 there, um, or 180. And... Um, then I did uh, a lot of short stories, um, what we call flash fiction, which are like one minute stories, one, two pages of a whole story. So I've got three collections of those. I've got a, a young adult supernatural thriller, um, the fantasy young adult duology. I have a erotic uh, dystopian. Uh, and my new one is a dark romance mafia thriller. But um, what's what's happened uh, lately, um, I decided to uh, rebrand one of my books, which is Stone Cold, which is a young adult supernatural thriller. Changed the cover, changed the blurb, um, brought out a new trailer, released it today to actually um, show off the new cover in the trailer. And um, fingers crossed, uh, hopefully I'll get some sales. It's I'm a marketing and promotion manager, so I know, and I with my clients the same. If a book doesn't sell, there's a reason for it. It especially when it's a cheap one for ninety nine cents, and it's still not selling. So you have to look at the blurb, you have to look at the cover, uh, you have to listen to people's opinions. Uh, that's what matters. Listening to what, what other people think. And, and so I rebranded that in the last uh, couple of days, and uh, we'll see how that goes. But I, I was also, um, I got a, a beautiful message saying I was nominated in the Hottest 25 magazine, which is uh, awarding uh, indie authors, indie influencers, and um, editors and stuff like that, and to... Uh, that is a really big honour for me to have been uh, nominated. That's coming out. A uh, big thing is coming out in a magazine when when that's released. So that's uh, really exciting. And um, I was offered a publishing contract for uh, Toxic, which is the erotica dystopian. Um, I work with uh, another author on that. We, we're co-authors. Um, mine's erotica and hers is clean. We're currently working on book two and we've already decided it's going to be a trilogy and the publisher wants to take us both on and take the full trilogy, which is really exciting. Um, what else? What else? There's so much. Um, yeah, my audio book, uh, my first ever audio book is coming out shortly and that will be for book one of the young adult fantasy illusional reality. That's really exciting. And uh, Broken Chains, um, it's up on Wattpad and on Inkit for people to actually read the first draft. But with the feedback I got from my beta readers and uh, a publisher, my market employ, which I, I thought was rather clever at the time, doesn't work. What I did, I've got three mafias, the Russian, the Italian and the uh, Greek in this uh, novel. And I thought I'd do legit uh, native language and then translate it into English underneath, hoping then it would open the marketplace to the Russians, the Greek and the Italians. But unfortunately, from the feedback from the beta readers and the publisher, it doesn't work. It stops the flow of reading, having to skip 
the actual um, native language and find the English to read. So uh, that's all got to be taken out. And I said, a lot of, a lot of work. And I had three amazing translators working with me on that. So that's a bit of a disappointment. But I really want this book to work and I'm really excited for it. So, of course, you listen, especially when more than one person tells you that something's wrong, um, you listen to them. Um, yeah, I think that's that's uh, everything. <laughs> yeah, that's what happened in the last uh, uh, one and a half weeks, all that. <laughs> wow, you've been busy, eh? Yeah? <laughs> never stop, never stop. There are so many genres in books these days. Uh, I can't keep track of all of them. And I know <laughs> that you mentioned a whole bunch of them. MC thrillers, that's actually motorcycle. And that's what that means? Club, yeah, motorcycle club thrillers, meaning outlaw bikers like Hells Angels um, and uh, the TV show Sons of Anarchy, and which the, uh, after that came out, every female author wanted to write a, a, a romantic uh, MC novel, but mine are a, a little more gritty and a little more thriller than the romance side. So there's a whole genre dedicated just for that. Oh, a massive genre, thousands of authors. And they don't just do what I've done with like four books. They do one series after another, after another. I'm like, where do you get all your ideas from? How do you not, how do you not sound um, repetitive? I mean, I've done four and I'm finished with that now. And I'm on to, uh, then I went on to a fantasy, then I went on to uh, something else. But these authors, they just keep bringing them out one after another. It's crazy. Well, it's unbelievable that there's so many, there's so many genres. Uh, what did they do before there were all these genres? What did they do with these books? I mean, what was it? I mean, when I first started out, we had uh, thriller, fantasy, sci-fi, horror, romance. That was it. Right. And now there's all these subgenres. So, of course, you because Fifty Shades, you have erotica. Um, that goes into even stronger into BDSM books. Um, you have books with uh, LGBTQ now. Uh, they have their own um, genre. And then you have um, sci-fi going into hard sci-fi. You've got epic fantasy. You've got um, YA fantasy. You've got high fantasy. <laughs> you know, all these subgenres just make these uh, first, like fantasy is no longer fantasy anymore. There's got like four different so subgenres to go with them. And Amazon is the ones that make all the subgenres. So. so if somebody is writing a book, how are they going to know where their book fits in? Is there a guide or something for this? No, that's a really good question, actually, Douglas, because uh, you can't, I mean, you, there are places where you can have what they call a, a book doctor look over your book and uh, decide what genre it fits in. You've either got an idea that grabs you and is so passionate it won't let go, you have to write it down. The author then knows automatically what it's going to be about. Is it going to be a horror? Is it going to be a romance? Um, or you start writing for the genre that's selling. So you go with what's selling at the moment. So say uh, it's still very high with fantasy and erotica is still very high as well. Um, so you write in that genre to make sure that your book's going to sell. So um, it's, uh, it's, qu it's uh, quite easy to um, what, uh, what your first major genre is. And then you look at your plot and you look at what's in it and the storyline and that sort of tells you then what subgenre it's going to go in. Uh, what is PNR? I see that on your bio as well. Ah, that is paranormal romance. Oh. That can be anything from vampires to magic, uh, werewolves, shifters. Um, mine hasn't got any of that in it. It's a paranormal romance because she has powers, but there's no vampires, there's no werewolves or wizard or whatever, but she has powers. And, of course, it's a, a young adult, clean romance, so that makes it P-N-R. I see. Okay. 
<laughs> what uh, which books are you promoting right now? For myself, um, because I've just re-released and uh, rebranded Stone Cold, that's going to be um, majorly promoted over the next two weeks. Um, I'm going to uh, be contacting um, paid promotion websites and uh, get that out as many places as I can, even free free websites and do some cross promotion on my newsletter. So get that one out. Um, I'm still working on two books. I'm still working on Broken Chains and I'm working on Toxic 2 with uh, my collaborating author. And um, But I have uh, so many books to promote and yet I don't have time to promote my own books because I'm promoting my clients. So I work like 10 hours a day, five days a week for author assist for my clients. And then I keep the weekend for myself promoting my books and uh, doing some writing and editing. Uh, we do have to kind of wrap this up. Do you have a website that you want to give out? Well, you can find me on Facebook, uh, on Namiwi, on LinkedIn, um, on Twitter. I am Karina Ganter, so I don't use a pen name. Um, author Assist, uh, you can catch me again on Facebook, um, and it's um, kcantusauthorassist at gmail.com. And uh, if you want to uh, contact me or, or see my books, I'm on Amazon, and you can go to uh, Books to Read and find uh, all my books on uh, iBook, uh, Google, and um, Kobo, Barnes & Noble. I'm wide. I'm everywhere. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, and uh, best of luck with all your book endeavors. Thank you. Yeah, plenty of uh, future uh, things to uh, work out and to sort out, and it's it's um, exciting. Yeah, thank you. For